everyone. Hi. 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 Let's start. Yeah. I am coming from Germany. I am coming from Essen. And raise your hand if you know where is Essen. Wow. <laughs> It's amazing, even <laughs> because 20 years ago, I had no idea where is Essen. I told you I wanted to go to America, but somehow I believe in fate, and fate brought me to Germany. Usually, I say we are coming from the heart of Europe. Why heart? You can see Germany situated between France, Poland, and all this geographical situation. But if you take a look where is Essen and Duisburg, you can see it is just four hours from Berlin, from Hamburg, from Amsterdam. So if you will come to visit us, you will have many opportunities to travel all around, even to France or Netherlands. A little bit about our university. I started exactly in this year, 2003. It's pretty long already, yeah? Because this year was very, very special. In 2003, two universities, University of Duisburg and University of Essen, united. And since 2003, we have really big, great university, University of Duisburg-Essen, which consists of two campuses. Campus Essen and Campus Duisburg. We are situated in Campus Essen. I'm coming from Essen. Duisburg is just 15 kilometers from Essen. It's not uh, so close, but still you can see Campus Essen. This is our building. I would say the prettiest one in um, yellow color. And, uh, Campus is pretty big, and here we have many. This is our building, this is campus. In summer, it is very relaxing, and uh, you can enjoy your lunch also on the lawn. You can see here we have many students, so 42,000 students. This is, uh, um, we have 410 professors around. We have many faculties. One of them is chemistry. And uh, almost every faculty has its own building. And main topics in our research are nanoscience, biomedical sciences, and so on. We have many international students. Here you can see some uh, coming from Asia, Europe, Africa, and America. In our university, we cooperate with 105 partners around the world. So our university is very international. And we welcome international students, and we like also to cooperate all around the world. Time for nanoparticles. You talk a lot this week about nanoparticles. I am not the exception. I will be talking also about nanoparticles. But I will be talking about special ones. Particles which you can find in your bones, particles which you can find in your teeth, and particles which are great delivery system. Raise your hand if you understood what particle kind am I talking about. Please. It's fancy <laughs> Let's give applause. <laughs> Exactly. Today I will be talking about calcium phosphate nanoparticles and they are special for me because for the last, almost since 2003, I am just diving in these particles and uh, we are doing a lot and I will show you how you can functionalize nanoparticles, how you can synthesize nanoparticles and I prepared also one video for you just to make it a little bit more entertaining. Ivana told you already a lot how big are nanoparticles and what shape of nanoparticles there are. But let's take a look. Usually when we are talking about nanoparticles, they are pretty small, up to 100 nanometers. Not bigger. Why? Because we are talking about nanoparticles for biological application. They should be really small to go through the cell membrane. 
And uh, if we are talking about viruses, they are more or less like nanoparticles. You also heard about that. Bacteria are usually like few micrometer cells are around 20 micrometers and so on. But also we can talk about different atom on the molecules. This is from my review article, which we published in 2006, but it is still very interesting to see what kind of nanoparticles are still exist. And here I just show you some prominent examples. And here you can see we have polymeric nanoparticle, liposomes, different kind of functionalized nanoparticles, multi-shell structure, and so different shape, different size different composition. They can be organic, inorganic, they can be like sticks, they can be... Uh, I, I've never seen actually huts like nanoparticles, but if you can think about that and advantages, it would be also great. Let's talk about calcium phosphate nanoparticles. As I told you, bones, teeth, they consist of calcium phosphate nanoparticles, and because of that, for our body, calcium phosphate is very, very natural. We don't have a lot of gold, right, or silica, or any heavy metals, but we have a lot of calcium phosphate. So if you can take a look, actually, the bone consists of calcium phosphate and collagen. This hard tissue is calcium phosphate, just very simple. So, and because of that, there are some great advantages, like by compatibility, by degradability, affinity to some biomolecules, nucleic acid, of course, not toxic, and is in preparation. How we prepare these nanoparticles, you will see in a few minutes. Today, I, will, I would like to show you shortly application of such calcium phosphate nanoparticles. We are working all around the world. For example, with Japan, we develop active paste to regenerate uh, teeth. Uh, with the Japan, we develop different kind of vaccines. With America, we do also transport of biomolecules in mini brains and so on. So some kind of application you can see here. Let's start with synthesis. Pretty easy one. There are different methods how you can synthesize really small calcium phosphate nanoparticles. Maybe you've heard about laser technique and so on. Today I will focus just on our method and this is so-called precipitation. Precipitation means you just have calcium nitrate, like a calcium source. You have the ammonium hydrogen phosphate. And, uh, the main parameters are pH, because if you have really low pH, uh, you will not get nanoparticles and room temperature. So you stay in the laboratory. You have two of these solutions. You have pump, and you start to pump this solution together in the reaction vessel. Depending on time and uh, steering condition, you get nanoparticles bigger or smaller. The main idea is here, as soon as you get small nanoparticles, you should stabilize them, because otherwise they grow into microcrystals, and we do not want to have it. So the idea is you have the syringes, different kind of biomolecules. The main idea is that biomolecules are charged, for example, negatively charged DNA molecules or positively charged polymers, and you mix them together, and after you have Imagine this is our particle consisting of calcium and phosphate, and here you have, for example, DNA molecule or RNA. But the main idea is that such molecules have negatively charged phosphate groups, and they interact with calcium, so you have electrostatic interaction, right? Uh, like this, if you play with electrostatic interaction, plus, minus, plus, minus, you can develop multi-shell nanoparticles. In, in my PhD work, I was working and establishing such kind of nanoparticles. I will put everything together. And here you can see you have calcium phosphate, like I showed you. After you have your add DNA, for example, on the surface, you stabilize nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles, uh, biomolecules are not protected. Imagine, such nanoparticles go inside of the cells, and there are so many enzymes. We just cut biomolecules, and they are not active anymore. For this idea, 
we decided to prepare one more shell to protect biomolecules from degradation. As soon as you have first uh, this outer shell of calcium phosphate, again, disadvantage of these nanoparticles, they are not colloidally stable. And you have to protect them again with either the same biomolecules or another ones just to bring charge on the surface. As soon as you have charge on the surface, you have stable nanoparticles, but you have inner layer of biomolecules which you can apply for biological purposes. Okay? So inner layer for biological purposes and outer layer for colloidal stabilization. And after you have really great nanoparticles and you apply them for biological experiments. In our laboratory, we have many devices because as soon as you mix some solution together, you have, what do you have? Cocktail, right? But at the end, actually, you need really good stabilized nanoparticles. And this is the main idea. And I will show you how we purify nanoparticles because after the synthesis, you mix everything together, you have nice particles. But you have also some free biomolecules which are swimming just around. And for biological experiments, this is not good. Why? Because you then do not know effect, if effect coming from biomolecules or from nanoparticles. So make sure that you have really nice nanoparticles. Here the, I show you just few methods, and this is from scanning electron microscopy. And you can see this is after drying, not in the color. And because of that, you have uh, you can see <coughs> small nanoparticles. They have spherical morphology, and after, if you measure charge on the surface, you can see because of DNA on the surface, they are negatively charged. But also, there are another methods to measure particle size in the colloid. And here, I will switch this for you. Here you see the motion of nanoparticles. See? Really great method. Why I like this method? Because actually, you can observe this under the microscope. And sometimes if you use dynamic-like scattering, just normal one, you put uh, yeah, your sample in the device and you measure size of nanoparticles and you just get the numbers. But here in this method, you can observe nanoparticles and see, for example, here, we can see some kind of aggregation, but we can see also small particles. And for example, if your solution come into aggregation, you can see like particles coming together and yeah, experiments is over because you have to synthesize new one uh, more stable. But I like this method because according to Brownian motion, you know, smaller particles, uh, motion, uh, their motion is faster, bigger particles is slower, and so you can absorb really great your colloid under the microscope and at the same time measure the distribution, the size distribution for your nanoparticles. Also very important to measure the size on the surface. And uh, <coughs> measuring size or charge on the surface, you can show this multi-shell structure. Calcium phosphate when it is pure, it is usually neutral, like you can see it here. But if it is like you have outside on the outer shell uh, DNA, for example, it should be negatively charged. If you have second layer of calcium phosphate, it's getting uh, in a positive direction. Purification. Purification is very important. How do we usually do it? As soon as we mix calcium phosphate, those particles, we add biomolecules, we have first shell, but imagine still we have three biomolecules in the solution. After this step, we centrifuge, do ultra centrifugation, and we can collect our nanoparticles, but free molecules will be discharged, uh, discarded. And so you can, uh, after each step, you do centrifugation and you do also ultra centrifugation. Uh, because after centrifugation, nanoparticles uh, are pretty uh, coming uh, together, and with shaking, you cannot take them apart. And for this, you need ultra centrifugation. So after each step, you just centrifuge and you redisperse, and at the end, you have really great nanoparticles. Talking about calcium phosphate nanoparticles, 
here you can see there are two kinds of approaches how you can add biomolecules on the surface. First approach, if you have calcium phosphate, you can add just, uh, how, uh, as I told you, different kind of biomolecules. For example, you add positively charged polyethylene amine, uh, you have such nanoparticles, you can add DNA, you have uh, also another type of nanoparticles. Or you can mix, for example, you have calcium phosphate, you add polyethylene amine, positively charged, and then you add negatively charged DNA molecules. This is great nanoparticles. I was working with such nanoparticles for a long time. The main problems exist when you start to work with bigger bi biomolecules. For example, you want to attach to these particles antibodies. And antibodies, uh, for example, this nanoparticle is around 100 nanometers, and antibody is also pretty big, comparable, like 5 nanometers. And this electrostatic interaction is not enough to keep antibodies on the surface. And uh, we were thinking, what can we do to attach such antibodies on the surface? And of course, the best attachment is covalent binding. And for this, uh, but with calcium phosphate, you cannot do it. And the idea was on the surface to add silica shell. Like you have calcium phosphate, you have really thin silica shell on the surface. And silica shell you can functionalize further. For example, you can add then, for example, tile groups on the surface. And tile groups uh, could be uh, then uh, further adjusted so you can use antibodies with cross-linker. Different cross-linker are uh, well known in biochemistry. So this interaction and you can develop very like complex but very efficient nanoparticles and these particles we use for self-targeting. Storage. Huh? This was the question when we were cooperating with China, with Wuhan University, and uh, we were doing many mice experiments there. But the question was, how can you produce nanoparticles in Germany and deliver them to China and still make sure that they stable, uh, they're stable and they do not lose their properties. Because actually, if you keep nanoparticles in the colloid, they stable just for, for example, for two weeks maximum, at 4 degree, at normal condition. But can you imagine, even sending per FedEx or just normal post, uh, no, you do not know the temperature, you do not know anything. And we wanted to make sure, and after we develop one method, and this is also used like everywhere, uh, so we just uh, decided to apply for our nan nanoparticles. What you usually do to your college, you add matrix. This is trellos. And uh, as soon as you have such nanoparticles with trellos, you can do lethalization, and at the end you just get powder powder of calcium phosphate in this matrix. And this is stable for air, I would say. So you can take this powder, you can send it anywhere in the world, and uh, cooperation partner can just add water, original volume of water, redisperse it and use for biological experiments. So after developing this storage method, it uh, was very easy to send or to, to bring nanoparticles all around the world. Uh, okay, and now I are ready. I would like to uh, introduce you to our laboratories. Here you can see chemical laboratories, biological laboratories. Here I do not work with cells, but we synthesize nanoparticles for biological experiments in sterile condition. So, five minutes of video and we will continue. What about sound? Can we hear it? No, we cannot hear it. Take so far. Okay. Can we can we switch on the sound, please?
let's use the time till it comes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, when you talk about the old score, you mean about the stability of women and uh, I was talking mainly about colloidal stability because if you keep uh, not in optimal condition these colloids, for example, you freeze them somehow or you keep them for a long time at room temperature, they tend to aggregate and because of uh, instead of small particles you have bigger ones. This is first reason. And of course second reason if you apply sensitive biomolecules, right? Which is also you 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 have to make sure that nanoparticles which arrive for example to China still have uh, intact biomolecules DNA or RNA and can be still efficient and for these purposes we just protect the strelos and we'll fertilize them and after that uh, they're more stable from any kind of uh, perspectives. Any more questions? Hello. Ah, mm. oh, okay, please. Hello, my name is Victoria Sakalova, Institute of Inorganic Chemistry, University of Duisburg-Essen. And today I will show you the synthesis of functionalized calcium phosphate compounds. First of all, you have to prepare a case of lactate and diabolium hydrogen phosphate.
video and I hope to see you next time. Hello? Okay, it's enough. So, do you have any questions regarding the synthesis and purification of nanoparticles? What I explained to you before, hopefully you could see it and feel it better. Now, how to prepare such nanoparticles? Let's, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, video. Uh, and uh, my question is, uh, it does not. Uh, it does matter. Uh, ethanol, uh, water uh, saturated, or ninety six percent is uh, enough for the synthesis. So you said that added uh, forty milliliters of ethanol. So it's absolute ethanol or uh, hydrated ethanol. Uh, it was absolute ethanol, but this is. Uh you could see here yeah, the protocol here in my video. This is the protocol how you can add silica shell and uh, to add silica shell you, you have to change a little bit the condition. Also you can find this video on YouTube if you uh, tape uh, calcium phosphate nanoparticles, something like that. The very popular ones. Let's talk a little bit about application of calcium phosphate nanoparticles and after I have small task for you. You appropriate. I'm curious about that. So if you will follow my lecture, nice, you can answer on all this question. No more, later. Okay, let's talk about nanoparticles. Why we apply nanoparticles? Because actually, you can see for even therapeutic purposes, you have to deliver different kind of biomolecules inside of the cells. Along these biomolecules are not able to go through this cell membrane. And for these purposes, any kind of carriers like calcium phosphate gold or any other, like you saw before, needed. So in our experiments, we look around in our laboratories, we found any kind of biomolecules which were fluorescent, and we attach them to the nanoparticles. And after this <coughs> scanning electron microscopy, we checked, for example, when we had cells, we incubated cells either with functionalized nanoparticles like you can see here, here from 1 till 9, depending on biomolecules, or as a control, we use just biomolecules. And of course, biomolecules, you do not see bright dots, right? It means that biomolecules alone do not go inside of the cells. But if you have nanoparticles, they bring biomolecules inside of the cells, and here you can see not so good, but still fluorescent density. Here, again, if you Maybe you can see better now these green fluorescent nanoparticles. Uh, you can see here cells which are stained with dark for nuclei, and you can see membrane, and you can see after 15 minutes they are absorbed on the cell membrane. After one uh, hour they go already through the cell membrane, and after several hours you can see real nice distribution of nanoparticles inside of the cells. Also, uh, we can apply different kind of uh, microscopy and here we can stain our also some kind of organelles and we can show that our nanoparticles go all the way in the cell and they are localized in lysosomes where calcium phosphate degrade and biomolecules can be released. Also in our group we work a lot with cell culture and with steroids organoids. Now we have learned how to generate mini brains and apply nanoparticles and such models are really great to test different kinds of nanoparticles. And this is one step forward in the science before you go to in vivo experiments of the mice. And here again, we can see distribution of red nanoparticles inside of spheroids. Next application, transfection. Oh, who knows what is transfection? Raise your hand. Okay, a few people are here, great. So shortly, regarding transfection, the main idea that you just introduce foreign DNA into eukaryotic cells. And you can apply different kind of methods. Either you can apply viruses or physical methods or chemical methods. 
How does it work with nanoparticles? Nanoparticles are on the surface after they go inside of the cell. <coughs> they have their nanomolecules, the DNA goes inside of the nucleus, and you have really great transfection if you have it. Sometimes you do not have transfection, and this is a pity because it depends on cells. Some cells are easy to transfect, others not. Also, here, if you apply calcium phosphate nanoparticles and you want to uh, synthesize green fluorescent protein, you introduce such kind of plasmid and you have after more or less successful transfection, like 44% of transfection efficiency in green fluorescent cells. Also, I like nanoparticles because you can combine nanoparticles with different kind of biomolecules. You can do them fluorescent, but also you can add specific biomolecules. And see, I like this because you can follow nanoparticles inside of the cells with blue color, but also you can transfect cells. And you can answer on your question, yes, all nanoparticles go inside the cells. Yeah, you see, all, all cells have nanoparticles, but only two cells could be transfected in this case. So it's like, I would say, maybe 30% uh, of transfection efficiency. The question is, this is not the problem of nanoparticles. This is the problem of biomolecules because maybe they are degraded and not cells are able to be transfected. Also some images. And also we can do 3D reconstruction and we can show here in 3D uh, red fluorescent transfected cells and nanoparticles inside. And here we also show the mechanism how nanoparticles go inside of the cell. Next topic, chin silencing. Have you heard about chin silencing? Raise your hand. Oh, we should skip it, right? Uh, if you're already an expert in chin silencing, so I usually explain to my students, chin silencing is opposite to transfection. Because during transfection, you activate synthesis of specific proteins. In this case, the main idea is to, this is, you all know, you have DNA RNA protein, and if you apply as RNA for gene silencing, the main idea you inhibit the synthesis of specific proteins by interaction of as RNA with mRNA. So this is like a very simple introduction for gene silencing, but the main idea just to understand that if you want to inhibit the synthesis of, for example, toxic proteins or uh, inflammatory proteins or any other proteins, you can apply chin silence. For example, here, you have at the beginning green fluorescent proteins, great model, right? If you want to check if your nanoparticles are efficient, you bring as RNA, and if they are not green anymore, which is perfect, you have 100% of chin silence. If you have few cells, you can calculate accordingly what is the efficiency of your nanoparticles. Again, different kind of experiments, and I would say Hill HHP cells just a great model to test your nanoparticles regarding the efficiency. Immunization. I think this topic is very important in our one corona pandemic, and just to understand how immunization is working, I, I will show you shortly. The main idea, when we do immunization, we want to activate immune system on different levels, and here you can see innate immunity, acquired immunity, what kind of cells are playing the main role. And for the last 10 years or even more, working with virologists, I've learned that the main players are dendritic cells. In dendritic cells, I would, I would call them dendritic cells like, like president. If president is sleeping, nobody working. The same with immune system. And during chronic uh, diseases, actually, dendritic cells are immature. They cannot uh, play their role like it should be. And because of that, see, under dendritic cells, we have different kind of uh, lymphocytes, uh, so the toxic lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, and so on, which start to produce, to activate, to fight viruses and bacteria, and so on. So the main idea when we use vaccine, you activate dendritic cells, and dendritic cells stimulate different kind of T cells, and so the fighting is there. Nobody will be, uh, like viruses, bacteria will be eliminated. 
There are different kinds of vaccines, but of course, uh, for us as biologists and chemists, we are working a lot with nanoparticles which can deliver certain kind of biomolecules. Here again, you saw already the synthesis of such nanoparticles. The main idea to mention here that here we apply antigens and adjuvants, two kind of biomolecules. Adjuvants you need to activate dendritic cells. Antigens just to, to activate further processes. So in this case, I've done these images just to show you how we can compare sizes C. Uh, this is uh, dendritic cells, T cells. Nanoparticles are pretty small, around 100 nanometers. And viruses uh, should be a little bit bigger here, but because they were tried and they are like biomolecules, I would say, they're pretty small. You can see that viruses can infect cells really good, but also nanoparticles are small enough to deliver different kinds of biomolecules inside of the cells. I would like just to show you one short experiment how we test vaccines, and we do it on mice. And for example, we would like to develop vaccine and we should find appropriate uh, mice model, and uh, for example, friend virus. Friend virus accumulate in spleen. And uh, if you have uh, infected mice, virus accumulate in spleen, in spleen grow like uh, getting really big. And uh, so you can, for example, what we have done, we immunize mice two times, just normal condition, and after we can do challenge. We can infect mice and see if our immunization was successful or not. Let's take a look. So this is just um, regarding specific T cells, but let's take a look here. If you do challenge in not immunized mice, you can see really big spleen, so virus is accumulated there and it's getting spreaded and you have really big spleen. But if you protect mice with calcium phosphate nanoparticles two times and do challenge, you see this is actually the normal size of the spleen and this should be so. Here we could see also a virus load <coughs> and any other parameters, but what I would like to say is that calcium phosphate also in this case can be helpful to protect mice from certain kinds of viruses. And the last uh, topic for today, I would like to show you application of calcium phosphate for imaging and drug delivery. Here, you can see schematic representation of such nanoparticles, calcium phosphate, you can load with different kinds of biomolecules, you could see it already, but also you can decorate them on the surface with antibodies, receptor, antigens, and so on. For imaging, for imaging we have strong cooperation with Singapore, and they work with Medaka fish. And fish is, uh, this kind of fish is very interesting because they are transparent. You can put fish under the microscope and you can observe not killing the, uh, the fish but looking the distribution of nanoparticles inside of the fish. I will show you now. And uh, this model is really great because all bone cells are fluorescent green under the microscope. So you can see interaction between nanoparticles and these green cells, which is amazing. I spent one week there uh, just sleeping uh, and doing experiments on the, uh, with, uh, on the microscope and here you can see the main idea that you have bone remodeling. Yeah? You have osteoclasts which degrade bone and osteoblasts which generate bone. And this is remodeling to uh, take place in our body and for example if you have normal process in your body you have Friendship between osteoblast and osteoclast. Everything is fine. But maybe you've heard about osteoporosis or osteopetrosis, which is actually real, real serious diseases. And just to better understand, if one of the cells, for example, osteoblasts are getting crazy, then uh, of course uh, osteoporosis or osteopetrosis. And then the idea here, some pictures from Singapore, then we, uh, first of all, try to inject nanoparticles inside of the fish. <coughs> and you can see it here, see small fish under the microscope, needle. And in this needle we put nanoparticles. 
And here, uh, maybe you can see even better, from in this needle you just press microvolume in the heart or in the uh, other parts of the body, depending on the experiments, the nanoparticles. Nanoparticle, of, of course, fluorescent. And here you can see under the microscope, as I told you, this kind of uh, fish is uh, uh, green fluorescent fish, but also you can see great distribution of nanoparticles. You can see mostly here, but if I would switch off the light, you could see that all kind of capillars and uh, uh, are filled with nanoparticles. Really amazing. And after you continue with another kind of biological experiments, transfection, gene silencing, and so on. This we've done like four years ago, and still we keep on doing in this field. <coughs> and now, coming we to summary. Calcium phosphate. I hope I could show you today that calcium phosphate is an amazing type of nanoparticles. Because they are easy in preparation, they are not toxic, they are biodegradable, biocompatible, and there are many applications. If you would have more time, I would give you more and more lecture and specific um, application of calcium phosphate nanoparticles. Because I was not talking, uh, talking about photodynamic therapy. I was not talking about bacterial diseases and so on. And all these topics are very interesting. <coughs> this is our group. We took this picture two weeks ago. You can see uh, our group is around 30 members. Uh, Professor Apple and uh, we have some postdocs and PhD students and students and all of them working in the field of nanoparticles, nanotechnology, synthesis, functionalization and application for biomedical purposes. Okay, and now we are coming to the next challenge. I prepared something for you. How many do we have here? I would say, can you please, you build a group of uh, three, four people. For example, four, 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 and for example, three. Are you okay? Yes. And your task, will be in. I will go around now. I will give you 10 minutes. And I will explain you your task. I want to ask you to be today very creative. Switch on everything or switch off everything what you know. Switch on all your ideas because actually in the science, the main, the golden, gold uh, quality is to be creative. Even there are no stupid ideas. There are ideas which could be applied further or ideas which should be forgotten, okay? And because of that, um, you will be the first group, okay? Mm -hmm. This is your one. I will explain it, yeah? This is, for example, second Maximum 15, uh, 15 minutes. I think it would be great to discuss for you in a group. So the main idea create your perfect nanoparticle. Maybe as you understood, there is no perfect nanoparticles in general. First of all, you should think where would you like to apply your nanoparticles. Maybe you would like to apply for, I do not know, to treat cancer or whatever. Try to think. Also, what I would like to tell you, this could be fiction nanoparticles. Because when we are talking about shape, 
uh, size, composition, and application, you can imagine or write a Roman about your own nanoparticle, okay? You can also choose if you want real nanoparticles, if you know some kind of nanoparticles and you want to introduce them, you, you also can do it. But be creative. If you develop your imagination nanoparticle, which could be applied maybe in 100 years on Mars or something like this for breathing or I do not know. Okay, I stopped talking. So I give you now 10 minutes uh, and you write down here and be creative. Uh, do an image. I think you have something to write and you can uh, like do a small image of your part of how will it look like, okay? And after, choose pre, please choose one representative from your group who will come here and uh, he or she will get two minutes to present your ideas and so on. Okay, ready? Okay, let's start. Time, 10 minutes.
back and see that, yeah, nice type of nanoparticles. Let's see what brings the future for us. Let's go to and let's move to the next group. And the next group will be. I saw some volunteers from the third group, so let's uh, let's give applause to the third group. about 50 nanometers in diameter uh, because it's uh, of a liposome type. But of course, uh, we propose to pack it into the polymeric uh, uh, shell uh, because it's uh, uh, important uh, for the target delivery of the, uh, the drugs. And as you can see, its shell reminds a uh, uh, double uh, uh, liquid uh, uh, bilayer. And uh, also it has a specific uh, uh, CLEX for the target delivery. And the um, uh, opposite is uh, usually spherical shape because it is packed with uh, uh, drugs uh, like um, uh, some alkaloids, for example, in pristine or in blasting. And uh, the purpose of, the, uh, of this nanoparticle uh, usage uh, in medicine, you've already thought. Thank you very much. Like spherical nanoparticles. We can talk about this later. <laughs> and why, if I can ask, size 50 nanometers and not 60 or 40? <laughs> <laughs> it's just about 50 nanometers okay. because the, 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 the thickness of the membrane is about 7 to 10 nanometers. That's why. We should have uh, uh, two membranes and uh, something inside, so it could not be less than 50 nanometers average. Right, thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the next group. One more time. Okay, I think this is the case number three. Yes, the stage is yours. Like um, 
I don't know what, what is this suit. Yeah, yeah, maybe protected suit. Protected suit. suit. Protected suit. Protected suit. And uh, if some area will be damaged, of course, we can cut the suit. And the suit may also be variable in size. And maybe um, someone will create this suit for, for some person. Because they are all different and anatomical areas are so different. Uh, different. It's why we can do it. Yes, we mean individual suits yeah. for uh, the patient. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
organisms. And how are you going to apply it, like cream? Uh, no, I Overnight, think like and then? We just uh, thought about it, it's uh, like multiple methods can be used, uh, but I think it will be more useful to do it uh, in a laboratory uh, with person who wants to do it because it's, uh, yeah, because of cancer it can be like um, hard to use by yourself. Maybe intravenous injection, yeah, so yeah. it's uh, the most prominent way to uh, renew a whole mm -hmm. organism. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give applause for our questions. We have time for a few short questions. Just to summarize for you, we had nanoparticles for the industry. We had nanoparticles for cancer therapy. We had again very interesting concept, not just nanoparticles, but the whole concept for also cancer treatment with some kind of radiation. And we also got anti-aging solution, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, really creative ideas. I think we've learned today a lot, and if you have just specific question regarding calcium phosphate synthesis, general question regarding study in Germany, life in Germany, or traveling in Germany, you have just now a few minutes of time to ask me. Yeah, please. I have a question about the tissue itself. You told us that we may activate this. We need to activate the cells, and these cells will activate the T cells, B cells, or what in our plasma. But how to prevent autoimmune reactions? Because how to control this activation? Because if we activate, it may lead to the development of autoimmune disease, and it's not so so good also. Great question, and I would say very complex. Yeah, difficult question to answer right away because it's dependent on what you apply to activate the dendritic cells. Because maybe you know there are so many adjuvants. Also, adjuvants are present in any kind of vaccine, mm -hmm. like albumin, mm -hmm. uh, to, or there are also based on organic many molecules. Second question: When or for which purposes are you going to activate the dendritic cells? First, maybe you have chronic. Maybe and in chronic <coughs> infection, uh, dendritic cells are immature, they're sleeping, so they should be activated. And uh, of course, uh, you have uh, this is very important point and should be checked. But uh, testing uh, on mice, you can directly see uh, under which conditions with which molecule you have such reaction or you don't have them. And this is will be my answer. To Thank you so much. And how uh, to detect activity of the cells? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, they produce uh, interleukins or uh, any kind ah, of yeah. other cytokines. So you can measure it by ELISA or FACTS or something like that. And you can see, okay, they awaken, they produce uh, uh, EL12, for example, or something like that. Different kind of cytokines. Uh, these nanoparticles can be used in treatment of uh, uh, osteopetrosis and osteoporosis. Uh, but uh, as I know, it's more uh, hormone-dependent diseases, and it's uh, frequently we see it uh, in uh, women after 45 years. Maybe it uh, will be more wisely to prolong uh, hormonal treatment mm -hmm. than use uh, these nanoparticles. You are completely right. I mean, uh, maybe in this exactly in this um, region of application, field of application, nanoparticles are still not the main players. But maybe uh, we can support with nanoparticles by, uh, like colleagues said, maybe transfection or gene silencing, just down regulating some kind of molecules, activating another kind of molecules. But of course, we uh, we have checked the main players and. Uh, uh, what I what I showed you, this uh, was just a model, model on fish, 
And first of all, before going directly to the specific question, we should understand the general mechanism, how nanoparticles interact, which cells do they like the most in the fish, that, uh, how do they distribute, and so on and so on. But your question is like future of our science. Okay. Uh, and if it's targeted, it comes to the target organ, how can it release the drug which is inside? I mean, exactly there are calcium phosphate nanoparticles. Uh, for calcium phosphate nanoparticles, it's pretty easy because calcium phosphate is uh, um, degradable. If you have pH under 5, and which is actually inside of lysosomes, and uh, also if we are talking about in vivo experiments or clinical trials here, yeah, we are talking about nanoparticles which still distributed, but they go inside of specific cells. And inside of each cell, you have more or less the same organelles, you have the same mechanism. So as soon as nanoparticles are in lysosomes, pH is there under five, calcium and phosphate are dissolved, or calcium phosphate are dissolved. So you have calcium cation, phosphate anions, they're just released, and you have free bio molecules in cytoplasm. And what is going next, depending on your, of course, biological purposes and uh, where you are applying the nanoparticles. Uh -huh. Last short question. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you said about your vaccines and the Okay, you mean if you apply them even in mice, or how do they distribute? Or no, no, no. for example, if you bring, um, want uh, to deliver them just to bones or just to teeth. Okay. Yes, it's uh, clear in mm -hmm. the two states, but right. uh, if it's, it is for the treatment of uh, osteoporosis, uh, for example, uh, to those uh, nanoparticles uh, being injected intravenously. Uh, will be spread and all the, over the body. So right. how to do it uh, uh, more directly? Oh, maybe you can answer this question. I still do not know, really. Because we are doing many experiments regarding distribution in EVA, and we also could develop already active nanoparticles just to use different kind of medical methods. And what we actually see, uh, like you told, if we do intravenous, uh, injection, we can see completely distribution, but we also could check which organs take the nanoparticles the most, and usually this is lung, liver, and if you have any kind of tumors uh, in, in mice, actual nanoparticles also go also directly to tumors because you know of this area is uh, just uh, broken and nanoparticles can go inside pretty easy. But the question, how can we deliver, for example, to liver, we try to do it with China, uh, in China with our cooperation's partner, and we decorated nanoparticles with specific antibodies. Yeah, to some extent you can increase uptake in liver, but this is not ideal, for example, just 100% and just to liver. No, this is still not possible, but uh, as soon as you can functionalize it. And, yeah. Still a lot to do and a lot to go and you are there and hopefully with our today creative ideas we discussed today a lot. So I wish you a lot of success and we will see each other in the field of nanotechnology. Thank you very much.